Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Robert Hazel, and I'm a professor uh, here at UCL, professor of government and the constitution in the Department of Political Science. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to hear tonight's lecture by Jack Straw. Jack has been an MP for over 30 years. He was first elected as a member for Blackburn in 1979. And in government, he's held three out of the five great offices of state. He's been Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary, and Lord Chancellor. So when last year his government left office, we had no hesitation in inviting him to become a visiting professor here at UCL. And he kindly agreed. Tonight is his inaugural lecture as visiting professor in the Department of Political Science. And what is going to happen uh, is that after Jack has given his lecture, he's going to be followed by Sir Stephen Wall, who is chair of the UCL Council, our governing body. Sir Stephen was uh, in the diplomatic service for all his career. He was the UK's permanent representative to the European Union in Brussels. And I think we've gathered from chatting beforehand, when Jack was Foreign Secretary, Stephen, you had come back, and then you were Tony Blair's Correct. Uh, advisor on foreign policy. On Europe, in on Europe specifically. So Jack will talk for a half an hour or so, and then Stephen will give a uh, brief 10-minute reply, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Jack, you're enormously welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, for that introduction. And may I say um, what a, a, an honor it is uh, to have been made a visiting professor here at uh, University uh, College uh, London. I hope you uh, think that too uh, at the end of the lecture as well as at the beginning. Um, my subject is Britain and Europe. In October 1818, the then Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, told his Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool, that the Congress system, which he, Castlereagh, had been so instrumental in establishing, amounted to a new discovery in the European government, giving to the councils of the great powers the efficiency and almost the simplicity of a single state. The Congress system had been established towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars by the Allies, better to secure some longer-term peace and stability across a Europe ravaged by two decades of war. As Dr. John Bew, the author of an excellent new biography of Castlereagh recites, faced with skepticism by his Prime Minister, the anvil of events, and his own suspicion of the abstractions and sweeping generalities of some of his continental allies, Castlereagh quickly abandoned his more grandiose ambitions for the simplicity of a single European state and worked the system in more limited ways to maintain a balance of power and so protect Britain's worldwide interests. Roughly speaking, the Congress system did, from a British perspective, produce the longer-term peace and stability which was its purpose, at least until the Crimean War of 1853 to 56. But that stability came at a price of standing by as unrepresentative and undemocratic regimes took the most barbarous actions internally to preserve their power, and in turn building up huge pressure which from time to time could not be contained into civil insurrection and war. The final remnants of the system exploded in the carnage of the First World War. This lecture is, as I say, as I say entitled Britain and Europe. In it, I'm going to concentrate on the 65 years since the end of the Second World War and seek to offer my own assessment of the progress which has been made and the dangers which lie ahead. But I opened with this quotation from Castlereagh for two linked reasons. First, because when I was reading Bew's biography, this passage leapt from the page. Castlereagh's style may have been dated. Its sense, however, is extraordinarily contemporary. I've heard exactly the same sentiments of the ambition for something like a single European state from many on the continent. And that notion has strong resonance 
in many of the preambular paragraphs of key European Union treaties. Second, I, I use this quotation because the ultimate collapse of the Congress system is a reminder of the drumbeat of European history that few political institutions, supranational ones included, are perpetual. The more entrenched they become, the greater the state which political elites have in them, but without periodic mechanisms to refresh the popular legitimacy of those elites and their institutions, they can fail. <clears throat> Let me turn first to the Council of Europe before I then go on to look at the European Union. We were instrumental in establishing the Council. Churchill spoke about the idea in '43. There was all party agreement about it here in the UK. It was agreed by 10 West European states by the Treaty of London in May 1949. Its most decisive achievement was that of the European Convention of Human Rights signed in 1950. Its drafting was led by the conservative jurist, British conservative jurist, David Maxwell Fife, who later served Churchill first as Home Secretary and then as Lord Chancellor. The establishment of the European Court of Human Rights followed almost 10 years later, and today all 47 member states of the Council accept its jurisdiction. We were, however, out of step in one important respect with most of our fellow members for years, because we did not acknowledge within our own domestic law the rights which the Convention provided. That changed in 1998 when, I'm proud to say, I took through the Human Rights Bill to incorporate most Convention rights into UK law. <clears throat> the Act came into effect on Gandhi's birthday anniversary on the 2nd of October 2000. Well before the Human Rights Act came into force, however, judgments of the Str Strasbourg Court had had a significant effect on the constitutional landscape and the machinery of government here in the United Kingdom. It is, for example, now extraordinary to conceive of a time when even the existence of our security and intelligence agencies was not officially acknowledged, not averred was the official term. Still less was there any statutory basis for the powers which they and ministers supervising them exercised, of intrusive surveillance, of phone tapping, of covert entries, and all the rest. And that continued to be the reality for five years after I first became an MP. Though there had long been a healthy debate in the United Kingdom about the need for a statutory base for the agencies, it was decisions of Strasbourg which ultimately forced the hand of ministers. It's in the nature of the necessary separation of powers in democratic states that courts may make decisions which are not appreciated by ministers and the executive. Since judicial reviews in our domestic jurisdiction and actions in the Strasbourg Court have the executive as a respondent, that will be the inevitable outcome of some of these courts' proceedings. In the UK, the existence of the European Court and since 2000 of the Human Rights Act has overall been beneficial to the quality of life for the law-abiding, if to, <coughs> it has been used sometimes by those who are criminals or terrorists. But in a democracy, the least meritorious must be accorded basic rights, even if they do not respect them in others. Across Europe, the Council of Europe and its constituent institutions has helped embed basic principles of common decency and treatment of others and is continuing to do so. Of the 10 original members of the Council of Europe, six had suffered occupation under the Nazis. One, Italy, had itself been a fascist state and an Axis power. There was no rule which guaranteed that post-war these states would become relatively mature democracies. And still more was that the case for Spain, Portugal and Greece, each with fascist governments until the mid-70s, and the Eastern European states, which were part of the Soviet bloc until the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989. The Council and its associated institutions have also provided the platform for standards of human rights, which EU members are expected to aspire to and to achieve and maintain once they become members. Today, patient work by the Human Rights Commissioner and the monitoring department of the Council is slowly securing improvements to the rule of law in countries like Russia, very much faster in Turkey, and even with recalcitrants like the Ukraine, it is at least giving authoritative publicity to the egregious defects in their judicial systems. <coughs> 
But the Strasbourg Court is far from perfect, and it has fallen victim to a characteristic of supranational organisations of all kinds, of widening its scope too far and with insufficient care as to how it sustains its own legitimacy. The case of Hearst in the UK of 2005 illustrates my point well. Hearst claimed that the law in the United Kingdom denying convicted prisoners like him the right to vote whilst incarcerated was a breach of his human rights. The British courts said it wasn't. By majority, but with a group of mainly senior judges against, the European Court in Strasbourg agreed with Mr Hurst. As Justice Secretary, it fell to me to decide what to do about this decision. I happened not to agree with it on its merits, but I've disagreed with plenty of court decisions and recognised my responsibility to implement them, as, for example, the Labour government was proposing to do in the case of MARPA, which restricted the holding of DNA indefinitely. My concern on this occasion went wider. It was that this was not an appropriate category of case for the court to decide. It should have been left to the United Kingdom's institutions to determine under the margin of appreciation. Moreover, even if I had been an enthusiast for implementing the decision, such was and is the level of popular and parliamentary opposition, there was little chance of gaining a majority for a wholesale change in the law before the last election, and even less now. I formed an alliance with a senior Conservative MP, David Davis, whose human rights credentials, as colleagues here will recall, are important. <coughs> he so objected to our proposals for 42 days that he forced a by-election in his own constituency and won it uh, with a thumping majority. David and I sponsored a major commons debate on the issue of prisoner votes in February of this year. The voting was 10 to 1 in favour of our motion of opposition uh, to this proposal. David's and my central point was it, that if the Strasbourg Court moved away too far from the purposes for which it was established and used the concept of the living law to widen its jurisdictions in ways never anticipated by those who drafted and agreed its founding treaties, it set itself up as a supreme court for member states, but without proper legitimacy and, crucially, without that democratic, democratic override which is a feature of every judicial system in every democracy in the world, however strong may be the powers of their supreme courts. This widening jurisdiction in Strasbourg has produced another practical set of problems, namely the overloading of the caseload of the court. The backlog of pending cases now stands at 140,000. Many of the cases it receives are from Italy, and they are about, in the majority, the extraordinary delays in the Italian judicial system. Petitioners to the European Court then get faced with delays almost as long or longer as those they faced in Strasbourg. Some reforms to the Court are in hand, but the Court, in my view, needs to go further. It needs to redefine the concept of the living law on a narrow, narrower basis. It should accord a greater latitude through the margin of appreciation to member states not least to recognise the absence of any democratic override for their decisions. It must filter cases better, and certainly in respect of Article 8 uh, cases about the right to family life, uh, in unfounded asylum uh, cases where these asylum seekers are trying to block their otherwise safe return to their countries on grounds that this would interfere with their right to a family life, the court should not permit the use of Rule 39 to stop their imminent deportation. I don't want a train wreck from the on pass over Hearst. I want Strasbourg to succeed. To, be, to continue to prosper, it needs to return more closely to its core purposes, do less and do it better. <coughs> Let me now turn to the European Union. Whilst we were instrumental in the founding of the Council of Europe, we came in late through a side door of the European Union to a structure moulded not in our image, but in the image of continental institutions with a different provenance. Whether we could or should have embraced the Messina Conference in 1955 and the original Treaty of Rome two years later is a moot point over which historians will argue for many decades. Given the freshness of our experience of the war, the very limited progress at the time on decolonisation, the profound connection still felt for those in the British Commonwealth and Empire whose peoples had fought at such a cost for us, our strong trade links with them and the concern to sustain sterling as a reserve currency 
the odds were going to be stacked against any British leader and government embarking on that course. Nor was it obvious that the unstable French Fourth Republic was so close to collapse and that General de Gaulle would take power, as he did, just a year after the Treaty of Rome was signed. De Gaulle's inherent suspicion of the Anglo-Saxons put paid both to Macmillan and later Wilson's applications to join in the 1960s. Significantly, though, especially given the later position of the Conservative Party, it is worth noting that in respect of the first application by the Macmillan government in 1961, de Gaulle, as I, and I quote, was determined to keep us out, says the British diplomat Michael Butler, because he feared the United Kingdom would gang up with Holland and Germany to create a Europe which was both too federal and too closely linked to the United States. Whichever side of the argument one was on at the time, Ted Heath's successful negotiation 10 years later for membership of the <coughs> then European Economic Community was heroic. As it happens, I was on the other side. I worked in the no campaign and I've, I, I've kept the, uh, all these leaflets that were dished out in that uh, campaign. Uh, there was one for the no and uh, a spirit uh, of uh, the total equality of campaigns. There were two uh, for the yes campaign. Um, um, I learned a lot in that campaign, not least about how widely uh, measures of public opinion may vary according to the circumstances in which the question is put uh, to uh, those questions. Before the campaign started, opinion polls suggested that a majority were on the no side. But as people had to decide, as choice was forced upon them, their view changed. In the event, and with an unusual homogeneity, the country voted by two to one to stay in. Britain could have adopted a different course those years ago, rereading uh, these pamphlets from the Yes and No campaign. What is striking is the similarity of the arguments on each side. Each promises prosperity in, re in return for an variously a No or a Yes campaign. Uh, each uh, asserts that disaster will follow uh, if the opposite uh, course uh, is decided upon in the event we stayed in. 36 years on, the world has changed, and so has the European Union, now with 27 members rather than nine. It's much more pervasive uh, an institution than even its founders could have envisaged, but one now facing a near existential crisis beyond their worst fears. I decided more than two decades ago that the in and out argument over the European Union was long past. We were in. Our institutions, our markets, our businesses, our peoples had meanwhile not just adapted to the new reality of the EU, but in many ways embraced it. And that has happened not least because of the cultural and social benefits of membership, as well as the economic benefits. And it's those cultural and social benefits whose value, whilst difficult to measure, I believe has been immense. I still have my first passport issued in the early 1960s. At the back, there are two pages which the bank had to endorse whenever one had wished to draw foreign currency, including French francs or Deutschmark. A maximum of 50 pounds was allowed for any one transaction, 250 pounds in total uh, during the course of a year without special permission under the Exchange Control Act, which continued, by the way, until 1979. The EU, uh, like the Council of Europe, has some notable achievements to its credit. <coughs> free movement of people and labour, of capital and goods. And alongside all of these, the free movement of ideas and the magnetic attraction of the models of liberal democracy which have spread south and east across most of Europe. And the Union has changed not only in size in the 40 years that since we got agreement to join, but also in the way, in the scope and manner of its operation. The 75 Yes campaign literature and the associated pamphlet from the British government are replete with assurances that we would not, quote, have to obey laws passed by unelected, faceless bureaucrats sitting in their headquarters in Brussels. There's an assertion that for a few commercial and industrial purposes, there is a need for community law, but English common law is not affected. And, quote, the British minister can veto any proposals for a new tax or a new law if he, uh, uh, no, uh, no reference to uh, the, 
the feminine in any of these, these documents if he considers it to be against British interests. Such vetoes are now available in respect only of taxation, criminal justice policy, social security, treaty changes and EU funding. A move to qualified majority voting was inevitable if the EU 15, then 25, now 27, was not to grind to a halt. That began with Maastricht, the arrangements are now in Lisbon. Driving these changes has been the, ex the expansion and the ambition behind the European Union for an ever closer union and everything that goes with that. <coughs> However, a key feature of the pursuit of this ambition, of which the current Euro crisis is the most serious, but by no means the only example, is that this has been led principally by Europe's political elites, who have sometimes been less than careful to ensure that what they've been doing on behalf of the peoples of Europe has had their active knowledge and consent. The two groups have not necessarily been in the same place, the leaders and the led. Research in other European states suggests that the publics there have wanted to Europeanize market flanking policies, in other words, welfare policies, and the elites do not. The elites have wanted the reverse. Two sets of opinion data for the United Kingdom over the last 12 months suggest by surprising margins that the public here do want the United Kingdom to work closely with the rest of the EU on counter-terrorism, policing, migration, international trade, defence, foreign policy and relation with the BRICS. And in a commentary, the IPPR, who put a digest of this data together, note that all this suggests that while voters clearly lack knowledge of and support for the EU as an institution, they still recognise the case for a supranational body at a European level covering a wide range of issues. Let me put that in my own words. The British public, like their counterparts across Europe, recognise that we live in an interdependent world and have actively to cooperate with other nations, especially those in Europe. Their concern is about the institutional structure which has been established to deliver that, the European Union. Political elites are a feature of every political system. They're a natural consequence of leadership in a complex society. One characteristic of leadership is to take those being led into territory into which they've not been before, to make difficult and in the short term unpopular decisions in the hope of vindication in the longer term. Most high-level political decisions are no more suitable for plebiscitary endorsement than are military decisions. There can be something of an unspoken, unwritten compact between leaders and the led in return for a, a, a greater good, uh, that some aspects of national life and public policy should be beyond the reach or pressure of voters to pick up a rather stark phrase of David Miliband's in a lecture which he gave in May. David was talking of European integration and transatlanticism, which he said had in Germany over time become non-negotiable articles of faith. In different areas, I've seen this compact operate in the United Kingdom. Take capital punishment or abortion, two issues which in some systems, uh, for example the United States, can and have been the focus of furious partisan dispute. Here, an understanding amongst the elites to treat them as matters of conscience has effectively removed them first from inter-party argument and then from active political discourse altogether. Elites can operate successfully in this way, provided their decision-making has legitimacy. In national jurisdictions, elections to national parliaments secure uh, that legitimacy. In Germany, for example, it remains open to parties to bring back issues of European integration and Atlanticism within their reach, just as here in the United Kingdom. Abortion or capital punishment could again become live issues at the polls. <coughs> in the European Union, by contrast, legitimacy is much more problematic. The need to fill the perceived democratic deficit is one of the major arguments in favour of a direct franchise for the European Parliament, and more recently, an extension of its powers of co-decision. The dismal truth, however, is that the longer the European Parliament has been established, the less has been voters' regard for it. Turnout in the EP elections across Europe has slumped, from 62% in 1979 to 43% in 2009, with key states in Germany and France showing declines greater than the average, <coughs> where once the uh, United Kingdom's turnout, 32% in 1979, uh, which had risen dramatically by 2009 to 34%, uh, uh, made us the outlier 
now we're not far off the average. As turnouts have fallen, so it's become easier for parties which do not enjoy success in national elections to become represented there, making discourse in the European Parliament more extreme, less representative and less productive. There's much academic literature on the subject of legitimacy in the EU. Some scholars have argued that there's a relatively new European polity which shows similar or even identical levels of democracy to those of established liberal democratic states. Some have argued that such legitimization is not necessary at an EU level. Others argue that whilst the EU may not suffer for, from all the <coughs> democratic insufficiencies for which it has been accused, it does bear one central democratic shortcoming, the absence of public contestation for political leadership and over public policy. All this research was conducted before we reached the current acute stage of the Euro crisis. I can't be certain, but I suspect that any, any new data would tend to confirm the third view I just mentioned of a significant democratic deficit because of the absence of public contestation for leadership or policy. <clears throat> Indeed, a characteristic of the collective leadership at, at an EU level in the last two decades has been a great reluctance to submit even major treaty changes to a popular vote for fear that the electorate will give the wrong answer. Or to use the Leninist expression for avoiding the populace and uh, <coughs> display a false consciousness. There were always good reasons for not submitting proposals to a plebiscite. I've deployed some of them myself. But there may be adverse consequences, and in the case of the Euro, uh, serious ones. I thought that I, ne <coughs> I need to spend some time in this lecture with a detailed exegesis as to why I believe that the Euro, the Euro was fundamentally flawed in its execution. That was before Jacques Delors' interview with the Daily Telegraph published last Saturday. In that, he lamented that the EU Council of Ministers should have made it its business uh, to police the Eurozone economies and make sure that the member states really were following the criteria of economic convergence. This did not happen, said Delors. There was a reluctance to address any of the problems. The finance ministers did not want to see anything disagreeable with which they'd be forced to deal. Well, then the global credit crisis struck and all the defects were exposed. As De Law's comments indicate, it's not been any alleged faceless bureau bureaucrats in Brussels who are to blame for this failure. Were it, the remedy would be very easy, unmask them, hold them to account. The failure is altogether more subtle and more pervasive. It flows from the method of doing business which the European political elite has developed of believing that there will always be a form of words to paper over divisions and to echo Delors' phrase not to do anything disagreeable. The fatal flaw in the design of the euro, which is that any single currency needs some sort of fiscal institutions of a single state behind it, was highlighted well before the euro was agreed, as Delors concedes. And subsequently, not to have addressed the current account balances building up inside the eurozone before the crisis unfolded was irresponsible. And those of you who have the text will see this extraordinary uh, table showing uh, Germany's rising current account surplus, mirrored almost exactly by the uh, collective deficit of Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain uh, going the other way. How anyone, in addition, could have considered the bond spread before the euro began and thought that a convergence of yields was going to continue forever in the ramshackle ram system which was established is also beyond me. And I give an illustration of how this, for the first years of its uh, life, uh, patently obvious divergences in yields for all sorts of good reasons were squashed together, but they were bound to explode as they have done. The clearest, most prescient warnings of a catastrophe around the corner were advanced well before the 2008 crash. For example, Paul de Groo in his book, Economics and Monetary Union, showed using 1999-05 data how the single nominal interest rate across the Eurozone was masking great differences in the real interest rate in different member states, which in turn was fu fueling the extraordinary real estate bubble which occurred in countries like Spain and Ireland. And the author said of this in 2007, the danger is that when the crash comes, the economy will go through a wrenching deflationary adjustment. <coughs> 
but elites either would not or could not heed the warnings. Would plebiscites on the euro have avoided the system's design faults? They may have. What elections and referenda do is to subject leaders and policies to the most intensive stress testing. If the euro had passed, it would have been altogether better designed. If there had been no votes and the system had not gone ahead, then the, the disaster through which Europe is now living would have been avoided. So what approach should the United Kingdom now adopt? First, whatever mistakes have been made in the past, it's in our interests that the Euro system should be repaired with as little damage as possible. Schadenfreude is not a policy. Secondly, we are not members of the Eurozone, nor will we be. <coughs> but we have a huge interest, direct and indirect, in how the Eurozone seeks to resolve this crisis. We should not hector our European partners. Such an approach was never persuasive, but we should set out our analysis of what has gone wrong and right for the EU, the likely consequences of a closer fiscal union, and our own vision of the European cooperation we need for the future. From the time that Labour abandoned its Leave Now policy after the 1983 election, there has been a broad cross-party approach that we do best for our nation <coughs> in Europe when we are fully engaged, not on the sidelines. As a new Home Secretary in 1997, I came to negotiating inside the European Union with some caution, but ably uh, guided, I have to say, uh, by Sir Stephen Wall, uh, then permanent representative in Brussels, I quickly spotted that partly because of the strength of political elites on the continent and the more personal nature of the alliances you could develop with them than we're used to here in the United Kingdom with our very strong institutions, it was possible to make a good deal of progress on things which mattered to us. I can think of many examples. I'll give just one. I doubt whether I could have successfully guided the Foreign Minister's Council to agree at 27, formally to starting accession negotiations with Turkey, unless Tony Blair, I and all my colleagues had been truly inserted into the system. The current Shadow Foreign Secretary, Douglas Alexander, spelt out the need for such approach today in an important speech he gave last month. I think the senior leadership of the <coughs> Conservative Party has now worked this one out, but they have lost a lot of time and influence meanwhile. Four, the academic evidence is now strong that the euro, even during its benign period, has not produced the benefits anticipated. It is the single market, not the euro, which has been the driver of greater growth and of interdependence between member states. The euro needs repair for sure, but policymakers need to concentrate on how the single market can be made to operate more effectively. A feature of the political elites in Europe, as elsewhere, has been intellectual arrogance. It's a more modern-day version of the late Douglas Jay, and for those of you who don't recall uh, the great uh, Douglas Jay, he was a Labour cabinet minister in the uh, mid-60s, uh, but served in the uh, wartime government as a senior administrator. His famous assertion, that quotes, the gentleman in Whitehall really does know better what is good for people than the people know themselves. Policymakers across the EU need greater urgency to solve the problems that have been created, but must also show honesty about what has gone wrong. In preparing, repairing the problems, they must be clear what the roots of such shortcomings were and ensure mistakes are not repeated as they lay the framework of what appears to be a tighter, if not complete, fiscal union amongst Eurozone members. Critically, as a large part of the EU enters into this still deeper union, and the demands for a referendum, at least in the UK, grow louder, the political elites must be certain that they carry the support of their electorates and do not, in repairing a fiscal and monetary crisis, instigate a democratic crisis which has the potential to threaten the institutional fabric of the EU and its member states. The seeds, I'm afraid, are there, as we can see from the, mulgum, the vulgar megaphones used by the popular press in Greece and Germany. The Greeks did fiddle their national statistics egregiously. And though, as the popular press is reminding uh, their readers, they were the victims of the Nazis in the war, as indeed were many other EU member states, uh, Germany has changed fundamentally since then. On the other side, whilst it's true that German taxpayers are resistant to bailing out countries less well governed than theirs, it is also the case that whilst Germany practiced prudence at home 
it was indifferent to, and its banks complicit in, profligacy abroad. To export cars, Germany also had to export credit. When Wolfgang Schobel, the German finance minister, complains of the unsustainable level of debt and deficits in other states, he might do well to examine the beam in his own eye as well as the moat in others. <coughs> Five, Shimon Peres, President of Israel, once observed that if a problem does not have a solution, it may not be a problem, just a fact. Our absence from the euro is not a problem, it's just an accomplished fact. There are mainly upsides to this, but there are some downsides too. We should avoid falling into the trap, however, of suggesting that we are outside Europe or the EU as a result. We are not. We cannot expect to be involved in detailed decisions on the euro, save where these may directly impact on our own interests. But we remain a major economy in Europe, a major market for the eurozone, and there's plenty else on which we should be engaged, from trade, the single market, through to defence, security, foreign policy, and the future size and shape of the EU itself. In my view, any discussions about the future makeup of and high-level engagement within the European Union must include relations with Turkey, uh, the, one of the largest European states whose uh, economy GDP has doubled in real terms in the last uh, 10 years. You may not know this, but 80% of all white goods, washing machines, dishwashers, uh, etc., whatever their brand, are made in Turkey uh, and sold here. It's extraordinary. Uh, I commend the stance taken by Prime Minister Cameron and Foreign Secretary Hay on the issue of Turkey. I'm well aware that because France and Cha Germany have changed their positions from the constructive approach which they took in 2005, progress on Turkey's EU membership is at a snail's pace. But we should be using all the influence we have to unblock some of the chapters. It is, for ex example, absurd to block the economic chapters in the negotiation uh, process, given Turkey's decade-long process. And we should also seek a wider consensus so that the Greek Cypriots, who are blocking many of uh, the aspects of uh, Turkey's application, can no longer subordinate Europe's critical strategic interest in Turkey to their narrow sectarian interests. Last, we should seek to do in the EU what we are also seeking with the Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights. The British public's view of the priorities for European cooperation, which I quoted above, are a good indicator of what should be the new agenda, EU action to cope with the rise of Asia, in the prevention of terrorism, climate change, the Arab Spring, major foreign policy challenges like Iran, less tinkering <coughs> with matters which should be left to member states. There is, for example, no reason at all why the hours of junior doctors should be determined at a European Union level. The very term democracy was itself one of abuse in Castlereagh's era for the political elite at the time. Indeed, he would have regarded a democratic deficit as an advantageous feature of the Congress system which he helped to establish. He saw democracy as a severe threat to the established order and the balance of power to which he was so anxious to preserve. But it was the failure of his system to adapt to the popular will, if it ever could, which led to its slow decay and then to its collapse. I am not so apocalyptic about the future of the European Union. It is a union of democratic states. But it too has to recognise the great dangers of pursuing policies which lack popular legitimacy and respond in how it operates as well as what it does far better if it is to avoid a similar ultimate fate. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Jack. And so Stephen Ward is now going to give a response. Well, thank you uh, very much. And when, when, I, when I worked for uh, Jack Straw, uh, when I was in Brussels and he was Home Secretary, he chaired one of the meetings of the, well, several meetings of the Council during the British Presidency of the European Union in 1998. And I recall after uh, a brilliant but uh, rather opaque uh, intervention by one of the legal advisors to the council, uh, Jack, saying thank you very much, none the wiser but much better informed. Uh, I think tonight we're both wiser and certainly 
uh, better informed as a result of, uh, of what Jack Straw has said to us. One of the things Jack Straw quoted, uh, a former colleague of mine in the Foreign Office talking about de Gaulle's fear that Britain would somehow want a federal uh, Europe contrary to French uh, wishes. It is very striking if you look back at the history of the European Union, as early as 1972, even before Britain had actually joined, the, heads of, the then heads of government of what were to become nine uh, European member states signed up uh, in Paris for two things. One was economic and monetary union, and the other was something called European Union. It was written into the communique. And just before the communique was signed off at midnight uh, in Paris, the Danish, the then Danish prime minister said, what do we mean when we talk about European Union? Are we talking about a federation or a confederation? And the Foreign Office record says, fortunately, President Pompidou, who was in the chair, uh, didn't reply and quickly brought the meeting to a close. <laughs> uh, Michel Jobert, uh, Pompidou's uh, foreign minister, subsequently told Jim Callaghan after uh, Labour had won the election in 1974 that it was an aspiration. Even economic and monetary union was more an aspiration than a commitment. Although if you look back to the documents of the day of the early 1970s, uh, most of the serious analysis says that the essential ingredients of a successful uh, economic and monetary union are a single currency, obviously, and that that in turn entails a single interest rate and a single exchange rate and a single economic policy, a single fiscal policy, a single uh, uh, treasury. Now, some of those things, or two of those things, are there in the Economic and Monetary Union that we have, but we're only now, all these years later, uh, 35 odd years later, actually talking about whether to have a single fiscal policy uh, within the single currency uh, zone. So what happened? Why did the, the gap widen, as it were, between aspiration and reality? And I think Jack, Jack Straw analyzed, uh, very interestingly, some of those, some of those uh, factors. I think. One of the reasons for the success of the project and for some of now the problems that we see in it was because although it was a, uh, a project devised by uh, elites and run by elites, and indeed, in a sense, the original dramatic idea that you pool sovereignty on uh, resources, uh, coal and steel in the first uh, instance, was so dramatic that it could only be done by strong leaders uh, with a determination to do something. But I think throughout the European community, European Union, in almost every member state except Britain, for much of the ensuing period, up until perhaps the last decade or 15 years, what the elites did had popular support. Opinion polls showed that in the member states, other than Britain, where always for reasons which Jack talked about, including our preoccupation, not, uns not surprisingly, with issues like parliamentary sovereignty, uh, that there was uh, popular support. But what happened between 1985, when Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor of Germany, told Margaret Thatcher that he was opposed to a single currency, and six years later, when he was one of its primary uh, uh, advocates? And I think the answer to that is what happened uh, was German reunification. And I think one of the elements in this story uh, until the relatively recent past has been what lay at the origin of the European community, namely the Franco-German relationship, and on the part of France, a real fear uh, about Germany. It's very striking that as late as 1973, President Pompidou said to Ted Heath, Billy Brandt was then the Chancellor of Germany, and Pompidou said to Heath, and Heath agreed with him, so I really worry about Germany. I, while Brandt is there, I'm, I'm, it's OK. But what will happen after Willy Brandt? Uh, and I was just reading this in the documents the other day. And Pompidou says, never forget that, only, that less than 10 years separate Stresemann from Hitler. Now, being a clever guy, I immediately Googled who the hell was Stresemann. The answer is that in uh, 1926, um, Stresemann, the Chancellor of Germany, and Aristide Briand, the Prime Minister of France, were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace for Franco-German Reconciliation. And that was Pompidou's point, that less than 10 years separates that event from subsequent events. And at the time of German reunification, a deal was done, basically, that France would accept 
German reunification if Germany in turn accepted the single currency. Margaret Thatcher was arguing we need strong nation states to stand up to Germany. President Mitterrand was arguing on the contrary, what we have to do is embrace Germany and this is the way uh, of uh, embracing her. And in a way the institutional elements of uh, the single currency were more thought through uh, than some of the uh, underlying uh, policy elements. There was an assumption that if the politics were right, uh, the rest would come right. I was working for John Major at the time. I recall vividly a lunchtime conversation in Downing Street between John Major and the then Irish Taoiseach, Charlie Hockey, when John Major spelled out what a single currency meant in terms of single exchange rate, single interest rate, and so on. And Charlie Hockey clearly had not thought about these things at all, but said to John Major, well, John, for me, it's the politics. Uh, when I reminded uh, John Major of this uh, story a few months ago, he said, yeah, even Helmut Kohl hadn't actually thought about the, uh, the uh, uh, implications. So we are now living with those, uh, uh, some of those uh, consequences for the reasons that uh, uh, Jack Straw spelled out. What should the government do? And I think this government, like all its predecessors, faces that great kind of paradox, which is on the one hand, what as a government it, it thinks is in its interest and the pressures that it faces uh, in terms of opinion, not just in the public, but more particularly within its own, uh, within its own party. I think if you look at the change in the language of David Cameron over the last uh, week or two, I, my guess is that the position that David Cameron and his colleagues have privately arrived at is that actually the thing that they think is most in Britain's uh, interest is that there should be uh, a deal on the lines now that Merkel and Sarkozy have outlined done at 27, because if it's done at uh, 27, I with Britain agreeing it, then we have the protection that the institutions do actually provide for us in terms of us not being disadvantaged in terms of the application of uh, community law. Whereas the alternative, as Angela Merkel has now spelled out, is that they go ahead at 17, and if they go ahead at 17, then we will have very little leverage and we will find ourselves more exposed uh, in terms of not having the protection uh, that the institutions of the European Union uh, provide uh, for us. So that on the one hand, and on the other hand, there are the very, very powerful demands, and my own Jack and Straw know this much better than me, but it seems to me that, that Cameron is in quite serious trouble with, some of, with, his, with his Eurosceptics, not just because of Europe, but because for other reasons they want to bring pressure to bear on him. So he can't simply go to Brussels and say, OK, I agree, let's do it. He's got to bring something back. What will he bring back? Who knows? The talk in the press is of some uh, kind of uh, emergency break. What does an emergency break mean? Well, Jack negotiated them. Um, an emergency break means basically normally when you concede that some piece of uh, EU treaty law will move from unanimity to majority vote, then you nonetheless say, well, in an emergency, we can apply a break to take it back to unanimity. Now, most of the stuff we're talking about in terms of the single currency is already subject to majority voting. So what we're talking about probably is in the end some face-saving formula. And the chances are that because a majority of our partners will want to do a deal at 27, we will get a face-saving uh, formula, but it's likely to be very, uh, not, not much uh, apart from that. So where, do, where does this leave us? It, le it does leave all of us, I think, in the European Union, exactly the point that, uh, that Jack made. And I, you know, I, was, I was one of those uh, men in Whitehall that uh, Douglas Jay was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, excoriating. And we all acted for the best of motives. Most, most of the people of, of, of Jack's generation, it's not Jack himself, because he was, he, was he, was he, he was a vote no man in 75, but uh, the majority of us passionately believed uh, that this was a project uh, essential to our success, our survival, and to peace uh, in Europe. I actually still believe uh, uh, those things. But the fact is that Jack is absolutely right in my view, you cannot persist in that, especially now that it's not as successful economically as it once was, without uh, democratic consent. And the paradox is, this is my final thought, how do you achieve that democratic consent? Because Jack's comments about the European Parliament are absolutely right. People don't believe in the European uh, Parliament because what is its relevance? The relevance of the European Parliament would come if, uh, as Jacques Delors uh, proposed, and the clip of Margaret Thatcher saying no, no, no was on the telly the other night, as Jacques Delors proposed uh, back in uh, 1990, that you have the European Commission as a kind of executive answerable to an elected European Parliament with the heads of government of the nation states as a kind of uh, Senate. Uh, well, 
when Jacques Delors made that speech, uh, every member of the European uh, community except Britain uh, would have paid lip service to that idea, although in reality probably very few would have uh, been prepared to uh, accept it. Now, the chances in any of the 27 of that kind of structure uh, being accepted seems to me to be uh, remote. So we are left with this rather strange hybrid organization uh, that we've, uh, that we've uh, created, and yet we're left, as Jack's concluding thought was, with the reality is that what other organization is there which, A, prevents quarrels between what remain quite quarrelsome individual countries from getting out of hand, and secondly, enables us to use our collective influence as democracies with shared values, uh, to bring our benign influence uh, to bear in the, in the world. So we, like Jack, I conclude that we have to find a way of making it work, but that has to include some better form of uh, achieving uh, democratic consent. If that turns out to be, in this country, a referendum uh, on our future in or out of the, uh, the European Union, then in my view, uh, so be it. Now we've got 20 minutes or so for questions, comments, discussion, um, indeed solutions, uh, which are clearly <laughs> quite badly needed to all the problems that have been set out before you. Can I take them in groups um, and ask you just to say who you are and where you're from? So, in the first round. Yes, sir. Tell us. Uh, Mr. Straw, uh, you talked about your paper about political elites being out of touch, democratic deficit. Stephen Wall referred to having the uh, Commission elected, the uh, Council of Ministers within the Senate, and the European Parliament. Um, perhaps needed, needed reform, for example, getting rid of the pledge list system where you referred to turnout. Nine countries operate the pledge list, they have five point lower turnout than the other countries where people can elect uh, their representative. But you, you have not, in your speech, come up with any ways to solve this democratic deficit. And it's actually getting worse now because people have now perceived Angela Merkel and Germany dictating what Europe should do. Uh, and uh, the Greeks have had their prime minister kicked out and the bureaucratic inserted. Italy is uh, the same thing's happened. So that deficit that you talked about in this paper is actually widening as we speak. Uh, so what could be done about it? Hold that if you would. Any more on this theme of the deficit or the parliament? You, sir. Jan Montier, Civitas International. Similar question. Um, as it appears that there is a democratic deficit widening, in particular also in the case of uh, Italy and Greece, but at the parliamentary level, um, I, a former MEP once told me that the European Parliament um, couldn't do the things that it does if it were the executive organ of the union. Then if it just works, it's that the MPs can say and do is, uh, is better. Do we not think this time, as it looks like the whole thing's even unraveling, that we just upgrade the entire system and actually have directly um, the European Parliament become the elected executive with the elected president? Thank you. And there was one uh, up at the back. You, you sir. Yes. Then as I from the Labour Party. Um, on the democratic deficit, I mean, one thing that strikes me looking back at successive European elections is that actually the only party that ever talked about Europe is UKIP. And I think it's actually been partly our fault for completely failing to engage under any constructive and positive arguments about the European Union for successive elections. And one example I'd give, I thought your, your final point about um, why should the hours of junior doctors should be determined at, at EU level um, illustrates to well, I think there are very good reasons why workers across Europe should think they don't want to be subjected, subjected um, to um, competitive devaluations in effect for their working conditions. So there, there are very strong reasons why we could be um, explaining why Europe is good for people, but we don't spend much time doing it. Yeah. Right. Um, on the um, gentleman there, um, I mean, but first of all, on, on the, the, the closed list. Uh, which we have in this country, uh, and uh, you could point out that it was my legislation that, that uh, went through, uh, and that's true. Um, 
and I could say, yes, it was my legislation. Actually, the, the, I'm, I'm, I wasn't particularly, there were reasons why it was the closed list. I'm not particularly in favour of the closed list, and I, and I would much prefer either the, an open list system or the Belgian system, um, which I'm happy to talk about at great length, but it was, but, but it, 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 and in the back of the, uh, Meg Russell knows this, if no one else, the back of uh, the uh, second white paper on laws reform, if you're interested in this, there's a detailed explanation of how the Belgian system operates. Essentially, you can plant, under the Belgian system, you can plant for a party, or you can plant for an individual. Anyway, it would be better, I don't think it would deal with the, the fundamental problem about the European Parliament, um, which is, and it is paradoxical, as I said, as its, pa as, as its role has expanded, it's not, I mean, it's not short of powers these days, um, and they were, they, they were being progressively added to, um, so it, it, it has lost traction. Um, and I think the reason for that is because it, um, there is no European policy, and I don't think it's going to be one. So what would my solution be to the problem of the European Parliament? It's certainly to pick up um, the, both gentlemen, if, if, if the sub subsequent gentlemen who ask, ask questions. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to happen, but if you want, I, I, I think it would be actually much better to make the European Parliament into uh, an effective assembly of national parliaments, as, for example, the NATO Assembly is, or the, uh, Council, uh, the, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of, of Europe, and, and end the pretense. You can have a, 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 a parliament at that level with a, a directly elected franchise. And that would, it, 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 it would make the EU more intergovernmental. Now, that doesn't mean you, you then ab abandon qualified majority voting, because uh, whether people like it or not, you can't, you can't operate at 27, uh, uh, giving tiny states like Malta and Cyprus a veto. Indeed, um, the, problems, I mean, the, the problem about Turkey's uh, 40 membership is really very significant for uh, Europe, in my view. It's, it's, a, it's a big, big issue. It's blocked because there isn't QMV over accession negotiations. So one state, which represents only I mean, two thirds of one island, which should never have been allowed into uh, the EU uh, in that state, in that condition, uh, is vetoing everything else. So you can't go down that route. But that, anyway, what I say, what I, what I would uh, do is, is make, ask my solution, it won't, won't happen, is, is to make the European Parliament in, intergovernmental. And then what you have is, is not a pretense. The European Parliament doesn't work, it doesn't attract the, the best people. And when they get there, they, they're not quite sure what they're doing. They're also very, I mean, some ought to be a subject of PhD thesis. I just offer this as a, as a thought. Um, <coughs> they are very vulnerable to pressure groups and lobby groups. I mean, we all are, but much more so special interest groups. <coughs> stunning me, because they are, are detached and not subject to public. Uh, who, who, if you ask me to name Ten Labour members of the European Parliament, or five, and I'm, no, I would be hard pressed to do it. I bet. Uh, and perhaps if we should try that, to, and only let people out if they can, <laughs> they can do that. But I mean, I, I can't do it. And that wears any list but maybe 50 MPs uh, off the top of our head. Right. I hope that provides a. a and I mean, are you, you, Daniel, you made an interesting point about UKIP. Any other party ever talked about Europe? Yes. I mean, the problem too about these European elections is that they simply become rather a desultory uh, referendum at the wrong time, it's always in June, uh, sometimes it uh, or sometimes <coughs> wrapped in with general elections uh, about the state of the British political parties, which again emphasises the point that there is no European policy. Right. Next round. Yes, you sir. Uh, it could be argued that the uh, Congress system started, broke down in the 1820s when Britain uh, supported Latin American independence and the rest of Europe opposed it. Of course, it was George, George Canning, the past of his successor, said he called in the new world to address the balance of the old. And perhaps the moral of that is that uh, we should look towards alliances with Brazil and India in the future and, uh, and to certain extent walk away from it. Hold that one if you would. And you behind? Yes? Yes, uh, I'm from the Economist. Um, I'd like to ask Jack Straw uh, on this point about plebiscites and the need for plebiscitary approval occasionally. Um, looking back, can, can you explain why you changed your 
on whether the constitutional treaty, which you want to go with a referendum on in this country, um, between that and the Lisbon Treaty, which was um, approved by the government of which you're a member without a referendum, how, how you can justify that change? <coughs> Mr. Peach, don't be shy. Remind us of your name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. You mentioned uh, earlier in your speech about there were successes in terms of social and cultural integration, yeah. um, and that there was a deficit now in not having enough policy debates. Um, why isn't there perhaps, uh, with this cultural integration, why isn't there more uh, a European media perhaps? Why isn't there this policy debate? Right. Um, interesting point about did Canning sow the seeds of the <coughs> destruction of the uh, uh, Congress uh, system? I mean. The, it, it, as, I, as I said in my lecture, roughly speaking, it, it worked until the, the, the outbreak of the war, what led to the Crimean War. Um, I mean, there, yes, of course, there were strains which immediately uh, appeared. You know, <laughs> 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 right. That's the 10 minute warning. <laughs> so, what you do? Actually, much worse happened in the old days here at the UCL. Um, uh, when um, I was round the corner at the NUS and the students were involved, in it. Anyway, that's a long time ago. Um, so, I, but, but on, on your, your contemporary point about should we, as it were, now be forming alliances with Brazil and India? I mean, yes, of course, we should be developing our relationships with Brazil and India, but the honest truth is that. that we are better able to do that if we if, if we do it with the strength of the EU behind us. Um, and, and when it comes to trade policy, I mean, that is one of, the, in my judgment, the successes of the European Union, rather unsigned. Um, but if, if we're negotiating with a job like China or, or uh, India uh, or Brazil, then it's better to do it, I mean, uh, agreed within the European Union than to try to do it by itself. And, and, the days when we were the dominant economic uh, and military power have, have long gone. And that, so whilst, yes, we should develop all, all of those relationships, that doesn't, I think, undermine the case for working cooperatively in the European Union. Um, John, Pete, asks me a, a, an uncomfortable question. Uh, <laughs> what well, is about why I, uh, as it were, changed my mind of, between the EU Constitution and the Lisbon Treaty. Um, I mean, the, the background, you were there, weren't you? I, was at, I, I, I left just after the agreement on the Constitutional Treaty was reached. I wasn't there for this country. But I've got an agreement to have a referendum on. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, I, I mean, what, what, what happened on the referendum? What, what <laughs> <Where is it? laughs> Over his head, buddy. Yeah, I know. I think you were acting against official advice. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. And what happened on that was I, I came to the view. Um, I mean, I started off, John, I don't know if you're working for The Economist then, but I originally had this, I can't describe it as a naive uh, belief that it was possible to put together a constitution which would be a relatively short document. Indeed, unusually, The Economist took a signed article from me talking about a constitution and comparing uh, the kind of constitution I had in mind with the length of the uh, United Nations Charter or, for example, the United States Constitution, which uh, does not run to... 300 closely typed pages. Um, but, but anyway, I, I was naive in thinking that. And I also, I, I was not fussed about the fact it was called the Constitution because that led to conservatives saying, Constitution, you only have constitutions for, for countries. And I said, well, hang on a second, you, you know, you've got constitutions for uh, the, the West Kent Golf Club, uh, <laughs> which happens to operate in Michael Howard's constituency. That's that not true. But what I, as, as this argument went on, and as I saw the, the size of the document and the pretensions in the document to the attributes of a nation state, like an anthem and all of this stuff, I thought that, that we, this is something we can't simply bash through Parliament. So I came to the view we should have a referendum on this. Um, Stephen was on the other side uh, of, of this uh, debate. But anyway, so that, that was that. Um, the, if you're asking me, well, if that was good for the, the Constitution, why wasn't it good for the Lisbon Treaty? My answer is that there were 
and our differences between the Constitution and the Lisbon Treaty, uh, a lot of the front finery of the, the Constitution is removed. I accept that it was a very fine argument, um, and I, since I guessed I was going to get this question, uh, I thought I, I would be put on the spot on this. And I, by the time that Lisbon came for decision, I was, I mean, I'm not using this as an excuse for the explanation, I was no longer Foreign Secretary. And I, I was thinking on the way here, what decision would I have taken had I been Foreign Secretary, given the fact that people would say, well, hang on a second, you, not somebody else, was in favour of a referendum on the Constitution. Um, and I think I would have concentrated my mind. So I mean, if you're saying the, 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 in substance, the difference between them wasn't all that great, the answer to that is true. Um, but by, the, by that, the time of Lisbon, there was a, a general view that you ought to just get this through. There was important things in Lisbon, by the way, one of which was changing, changing QMV, so you could have further large member states in, uh, including Turkey. Um, on social and cultural integration, I wasn't suggesting there that there was a sort of democratic deficit, because I was talking about one of the, the sort of indirect but very important consequences of EU membership is that we you know, have achieved a fairly high degree of social and cultural integration. That does not mean homogenization at all. You know, why should it? But the fact that um, uh, this great university, as many others, have such a, a, a wide range of students and, and, alum, and, and faculty from the EU, and, it's, and so do others abroad, the fact that they're are hundreds of thousands of people from France working uh, in London and, and vice versa, is one of the really great things about the uh, EU. Should we have a, um, I mean, I, I, to some extent, it, it's, it's a surprise that we don't have a, uh, a single, um, a, any kind of sort of media across Europe. But that really is, 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 is I think, a function of a, the absence of a policy across Europe. And I think <coughs> the things which, which it's very striking about Scotland, since it, uh, it took back legislative powers and became far, far more devolved than ever it was in <coughs> 1999, is how increasingly distinctive its media has become. And I say that the media, the media goes where the power is, in my view, as well as there being a linguistic issue. So that's my answer. Stephen's going to come. Just on, on, John, on, on, John's, on John's point about the Lisbon Treaty, I mean, I, do th I, mean, I, I certainly uh, felt, as I said when I was involved in government, when I left government, I, I was, and became, as it were, a private citizen. I appeared on you know, various platforms trying to sell the, the Lisbon Treaty. And this issue came up time and time again. And you could make the argument, to the extent that Jack has done, and I was on a platform with Vernon Bogdanor, a very distinguished constitutionalist, who made the argument much more clever than I could, but you've got absolutely no purchase on it. Uh, and I think, and I see this more clearly uh, now, I mean, it's, it's rather like the Lib Dems and, and tuition fees. They can make any argument they like uh, about, you know, the nation's need and at a time of crisis, but most of us think they made a promise and they went back on it. And I think the general perception on yes, the constitutional right. period is well as a promise was made and the yeah. government went back on it, and then you can't get around it. Yeah. I, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I also agree with the point about the Lib Dems being stuffed on tuition fees. Time for the next round, and this may be the last round. Uh, so let's see how many people. Uh, I think it might be the last round. Yes, starting with you, Madam, in the middle, and remind us who you are. Oh, that if you would. You, sir, right at the back. Uh, James Jacobs, student here. I wanted to ask, Mr. Straw, you said that uh, there was a view of the Lisbon Treaty that should be got through by, it, that they should just get this through. And it shocks me, this idea, that when an idea is rejected by two European, uh, as a, by two countries for a constitution, that the European ministers promptly decide that they will ignore it and push it through. It highlights the democratic deficit 
corrupt organization. <laughs> Any more? No? Yes, there's one more. Uh, you, in, in the green scarf. Uh, is uh, all the way up, ECL, Whitehall, from the European Commission, and everything else? Speak up, uh, if you would. You um, spoke about um, concerns uh, that uh, the electorate might produce a wrong answer for any given referendum on any EU matter which, to my mind, immediately raises the further question, why might they give the wrong answer? Um, and isn't the answer to that, that Britain's relationship with the EU has been characterized virtually from, from the end of the Second War as a lack of political leadership? Um, I contrast it, for example, with the creation of Great Britain, which from the very beginning was an elite project but one into which the political leadership bought hook, line, and sinker. The last British Prime Minister to speak in any positive way about the European Union, as it now is, was Edward Heath. Um, and I am old enough to remember a very brief period in 1975, uh, during the referendum, where Heath and uh, a number of other senior politicians spoke uh, very eloquently and positively about Europe, and that, I have no doubt, was one of the reasons why there was a resounding vote in favour of staying in it. Um, but that soon evaporated, and ever since then we have um, successive Prime Ministers coming back from negotiations, talking about red lines, victory for Britain, and all the rest of it. Um, isn't that why the British public is not um, as positive about Europe uh, as, as other member states. Thank you. And was there one more? Yes. I'd like to press both of these a little bit more about the Europe. Uh, we've been skirting around somewhat. Uh, it's not at all clear that there will be successful outcomes to the present set of initiatives. And I'd like them both perhaps to speculate a little bit more when they have done about what the possible consequences could, could be, mm. both for the United Kingdom. The possibility, disasters are sometimes an opportunity for remaking the institutions. And remind us who you are. Oh, sorry, Bob Weiss. Thank you. <laughs> you might you appear into a crystal ball dark thing. <laughs> um, Thank you, we're first. Right, then. okay. Um, well, to the uh, lady who asked the first uh, question, uh, saying that why did the European Parliament work in the way that if there was legislation, it was it wasn't just voted down, it was sent away. I mean, this, this arises principally because it, it, the, the European Parliament, I mean, Stephen's the expert on this, um, but the European Parliament has, has a, a, a role of key decision. It doesn't operate in the way, say, that a normal national parliament uh, does. Um, I mean, I don't have a, a... And the proposals will have gone through the mill of uh, being proposed by the, the Commission. I mean, it's possible for member states in certain circumstances to uh, make legislative proposals, but uh, it's easy to block those. Um, but, and most of them come through the, uh, through the Commission. Um, they go through the middle of the, of the Roman Council of Ministers, um, and then they go to Parliament, and then there's a process of negotiation. Um, and why, and, and I mean, the, the, I mean I, I've never sat in the European Parliament, I've sat in the European <coughs> Council of Ministers. And there's sometimes been occasions where we wanted one thing, we we're facing a sort of block in the European Parliament. And you want, if, if it's gone through the Council of Ministers, the Council of Ministers and the Commission then want it through, so there's a process of negotiation, like trying to beat it, beat the European Parliament down. With a sort of unwritten, unspoken sense that there is greater legitimacy in the hands of the uh, ministers in Brussels than there, there is in the hands of the European Parliament. So that's why this process is so different from the uh, normal standard processes of legislation. I mean, it's one more reason why I think the institution is unsatisfactory and why we practically would better off go to um, an, an assembly of national parliaments. We'd just, uh, we'd, we'd just be cleaner. Um, on the um, 
issue of um, which um, you said at the back uh, raised about um, didn't this um, to highlight that the, there was a huge democratic the, over Elizabeth a huge democratic deficit in a corrupt institution. I mean, I don't think the European Union is corrupt. Um, I mean, it's very clear. Um, uh, I think there is there is there are elements of the EU which, um, particularly member states, which may be corrupt. But that, that also ties to the to the European Union. I mean, the, the problem was that there there was there was a need for some of the changes which ended up in Lisbon, um, not least over the increasingly amount of QMV uh, and the way that. Uh, QMV operated because it operated in a very eccentric way, um, and, and which did not properly represent the, the strength of the individual member states. There were other changes uh, <coughs> in terms of, of cooperation, and, and all of us were stuck. You needed you know, greater cooperation on immigration and asylum. Well, if, if you want that, if you want to end up in a situation where anyone <coughs> can veto that change, that's that's a difficulty. It worked all right at six and nine, but at, at fifteen it was really getting difficult. Stephen, wasn't it? And at twenty-seven it becomes impossible. So the the view was taken for <coughs> honourable reasons that we wanted to get it through. But I entirely accept what Stephen said. Uh, that you know I could talk till I was blue in the face, of, uh, but explaining the difference. And I let me say, I did uh, quite often uh, in, in Blackburn Town Centre on my soapbox because uh, there is. Uh, no uh, more, more difficult if you have to be the member for Blackburn anyway than, than my soapbox where people can ask you anything did I used to get to the <coughs> week after week uh, and people's eyes used to glaze over and I then got to talk about Burnley which was always uh, always far better uh, if you want to raise a smile but anyway it, it's, I don't regard it as the most impressive episode in the last uh, government's uh, history All right, and I don't suggest that uh, my role was uh, brilliant either. Now, um, the um, gentleman in the white top uh, talked about, um, uh, well, when I talked about the, 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 the worry about, about uh, amongst European elites um, putting uh, in items to plebiscites because they were concerned that might produce a wrong answer. I mean, I know being to some extent ironic, but, but there, there has been uh, that anxiety. Um, I don't accept that um, no one's spoken up for the European Union um, since Ted Heath in the early 1970s. I mean, in, indeed, Tony Blair spoke up for the European Union repeatedly. He was very strongly in favour of the European uh, Union. Um, now, on every member state, when it, it, the head of government or foreign minister or other minister, when they get back home, they want to say they've done well. You don't get back and say, well, we've nothing happened, uh, or it was all a disaster. Uh, you say, you know, we got this, we got that. Why wouldn't you? Uh, because you've been involved in this collective negotiation. And don't forget, it's just a fact, again, it's a fact of life. It's, a, it's a, one of Shimon Peres, it's facts, that we've got here a press, part of whom sell newspapers on the grounds of kind of continuing hostility to, to Europe, and I may say to some of them, but it's done a failure in chapter as well. So you, you've got to just handle that. But even if it wasn't, if it, and it was an entirely benign press, still want to say, yes, it's we done well. You know, why? Because that, that's what, well, not, not only politicians do, it's also what uh, 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 people do. What is the case is that the, I mean, it's great, greatly ironic, it was, it was Tony Benn who put the, forward the idea of having a referendum uh, on the membership of the European Union to um, consternation. Uh, in, in the Labour Party to begin with, as, as well as um, to, to the government. And the idea was that that would lead to Britain's withdrawal, because the public would play me so overwhelmingly against it. But it led to the reverse of that. And, and one of the reasons it did was, I mean, I, I was there uh, as a, uh, a sort of spear carrier working for the No campaign, was because the arguments that the Yes campaign were advanced were much more substantive than the arguments the No campaign were, were, were advancing. And we weren't or the campaign, the leaders of the campaign, weren't able to raise a vision for what they wanted uh, uh, for, for Britain. Um, and that, in fact, as it were, gave our membership of the European Union legitimacy for a generation or so. The difficulty is that that legitimacy has not been renewed. And, may, and 
which is what, by the reason we've got this problem, not just here but across Europe right now. On the Euro, so, well, look, um, so I, I, I never thought the Euro was a good idea, and uh, I still carry on in my pocketbook um, Gordon Brown's five tests, um, and I've got, them, I've, I've got them here. I had to carry them around because I've got a good memory, but I could never remember them because they're not remotely uh, cognate and they don't flow off at the time. Uh, uh, but, but anyway, they were convergence, sustained and durable, jobs, flexibility, creation, investment impact, financial services, and then fifth, uh, flexibility, more flexibility. Um, and um, uh, those, those um, uh, tests uh, were drawn up such that it was impossible for Britain ever in any circumstances to, uh, <laughs> to pass them and join the euro, which I personally thought was a, a, a good thing. Uh, and I, di I did think. I never thought you could have a single currency without many of the attributes of a single state, and that could not mean uh, just having a single interest rate. Uh, indeed, you have a single interest rate, and therefore a single exchange rate, and don't have some of the attributes of uh, fiscal attributes of a state, you end up with these huge difficulties that you've got, because um, the interest rate was right for Germany, and the exchange rate brilliant for Germany, uh, but uh, not for uh, other states. But that doesn't lead me to say, uh, therefore, uh, it would be in our interests to see the whole thing fail. I mean, that would, so that's when I said, why I said, Schadenfreude is not the policy. It isn't. I told you so, it's not the policy. Uh, it's a really serious situation. And it would be better for us, as well as for members of the yeah, Eurozone, if it is possible to repair the current situation with the least possible damage. Now, what will happen if uh, if that does, doesn't occur, well, it may mean Greece, uh, uh, the markets have judged that Greece is in default and can't pay its way, um, it may leave. Uh, that's a fairly big problem, except for uh, the banks who are indebted uh, to uh, hold uh, Greek bonds and Greek private debt. Uh, I don't think that alone would be a catastrophe because Greece's economy uh, it's two percent of the total uh, becomes much more serious uh, as you move west. So uh, my guess is, I mean, it's a long, but I mean, my instinct is that this is so serious that a deal will be put together, and because uh, I think that the, the consequences of a thing falling apart would be terrible. Um, Say, so if Greece were to leave, well, they'd go through some of the problems that Latin American countries went through when they came off the dollar. Uh, years ago, and they would then bounce back. The Greece might bounce back, but it would have it would deal with its need for wage cuts and cuts in living standards uh, by the hidden hand of the exchange rate, rather than the explicit decision of politicians. And in many cases, that's better. That's not available. So I just think we have to work, do our best to ensure there is a repair job done. It will be serious uh, if there is a one. Team, how optimistic are you? That the, no, well, the I'm not. I wish I, wish, I wish, I wish, I was more optimistic. I mean, I, I think you know, prediction is a is a mugsy. I mean, the research I'm doing in the in Britain and Europe in the 1970s, one of the very striking things is that at no point anywhere in the early 1970s, in all the futurology that's done, does the idea that uh, Europe will not be dominated by the end of the 20th century by two super superpowers, including the Soviet Union. Nobody thinks other than that the Soviet Union will be one of the dominant superpowers. So, you know, you, it's very easy to. Uh, to not be able to, to see very clearly. I think, though, that what has happened so far is too little too late. And you could certainly see, I think, clearly now looking back, that it more happened indeed at the time, uh, that more, much more money and more dramatic way needed to be thrown at this issue than was in fact the case. And I still think that too little is being done potentially uh, uh, too late. The steps that they are now proposing to take, which given that they do involve treaty change, whether it's at 17 or at 27, will take a long time are significant but uh, relatively uh, modest. One of the elements of that is effectively the reinvention uh, of the Stability and Growth Pact invented by France and Germany and bust by France and, uh, yep. and Germany uh, within uh, a very short space of time. And I don't myself, I mean, I think you know, the analysis that was done way back in the 1970s remains correct, that actually um, the ingredients of this have to go very far, as Jack says, they have to effectively political union of a kind that has no real support, I think, in any, in any uh, member state. And that does include the thing which, uh, to a limited extent, happens, but not enough, 
is fiscal transfers from uh, from uh, rich to poor, uh, and that's what the you know the Angela Merkel for very understandable domestic reasons she'd lose power if she were to take a different position uh, has set her, her face against. So I think a benign scenario is that you know to use the uh, common phrase that the can gets kicked along the road sufficient to keep the thing to keep the thing going, but I think it's the, the long term prognosis in terms of, of stability and success does not look to me very good. If it did uh, collapse, and obviously you know, a default by one of the large uh, members of the Eurozone could uh, precipitate that, what that spells for the survival of the European Union, I think is very hard to judge, because the circumstances in which that collapse happened would be so dramatic in terms of the economies of the country that I think that the resurgence of sort of beggar my neighbor uh, populism uh, in the existing member states could be could be very strong, and I mean I think that would be I think that would be a tragic but tragic because I do think that the European Union has played a huge part uh, in the preservation of, of and furtherance of peace and stability uh, in our continent since World War II, and enlargement is a very good example of that. The countries of Eastern and Central Europe would not necessarily have become uh, democracies without the prospect of the European Union. Uh, so, but I, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm for, the, for the first time ever, really, I'm gloomy. Well, <laughs> I'm going to offer you a chair. After that gloomy note, I'm going to tell you about drink. It's the custom at UCL to offer a drink to all professors after their inaugural lecture. And tonight's drinks are going to be in the Terrace restaurant. And we're going to leave out of this door, and you're going to turn right and right again. And the staff are going to lead the way. And so just tag along in the crocodile. Please, all of you, do come and join us and celebrate the inaugural lecture of Professor Jack Straw. Thank you very much.